Coming up on this Thursday edition of Daybreak, emergency services continue their search overnight for the almost 300 people missing after a ferry sank off Korea's southwestern coast. At least six people have so far been confirmed dead. Korea and Japan agree to hold regular working level talks on the Japanese military's wartime sexual enslavement of Korean women during World War II. The two sides will meet again next month. Plus, Korea's finance minister says the government will front load 60% of its annual budget in the first half of the year, up from an initial plan of 55% to give the economy a much needed shot in the arm. Daybreak begins now. Hello and thanks for joining us. To our viewers here in Korea and around the world, it's 6 a.m. on Thursday, April 17th here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom and you're tuned in to Daybreak. A major rescue operation is continuing off Korea's southwestern coast on this Thursday morning after a ferry carrying 475 people capsized. Six people have been confirmed dead, but nearly 300 others remain unaccounted for some 20 hours after the ship started sinking. Most on board the Sewol ferry were teenagers, high school students heading to Korea's southern Jeju Island for a field trip. Now we're going to connect to our uh, Kim Jian live at the news centre for the latest on this tragedy. Jian, hundreds remain missing despite this frantic almost day-long search and rescue operation. Mark, it really is an agonizing wait for the families of the missing who are sick with worry. Search and rescue teams have been working through the night, but the lack of light and strong sea currents have made it almost impossible for divers to get under the water and try and locate the missing. Rescuers had to constantly use their flares to get some light over the pitch darkness covering the ocean. The part of the sea in which the ship sank is reported to be at least 30 meters deep and filled with boulders and rocks. The search operation was stopped for several hours last night, but resumed at 1 a.m. Korea time. That's around five hours ago. Local media outlets here in Seoul say that the water temperature is low, and experts have said even two hours of exposure to the cold waters can be life-threatening. The entire nation is in a state of shock. Yes, they certainly are. And uh, there have been a series of text messages also emerged in local media here in Korea that appear to show the complete confusion and fear those on board were feeling. You're right. These messages are drawing the nation's hearts towards the victims and the victims' families. Some of the texts describe the state of the ferry, saying the ferry looks like it's really going to capsize. And there were others that wanted to reach out to their families and say what could be their final words. It reads, Mom, just in case I can't see you again, I just wanted to say that I love you, were one of the texts from one of the many high school students that were on board heading to their destinations for their field trip. Majority of the passengers were the students. 325 students and 14 teachers were on board the ferry. Yes, it's extremely sad and we can't even imagine how the parents are feeling waiting for news about their, their son or, or daughter. What has the government's response to this disaster been? Well, the government is making all-out efforts to save any possible survivors. President Park geun and Defense Minister Kim Gon jin ordered that all Navy, Coast Guard and nearby vessels help with the efforts. Dozens of ships, aircraft, along with hundreds of specialized forces and professional divers are actively searching for survivors. The U.S. Navy also sent a ship with helicopters on board to join the operation. A mystery surrounds what caused this ferry to capsize. There's speculation it might have hit a submerged uh, reef or rocks. 
Well, the focus here remains on the rescue operations, so there are only speculation at this point about what caused the ferry to sink. Survivors say, however, that they heard a loud bang right before the ferry started to go down. And since there are clusters of big rocks and boulders at the site where the ferry sunk, it is presumed the ferry hit a boulder and started to tilt. Many were trapped inside the ferry and couldn't get free, as some say that they were told to stay put rather than escape the ferry, which is not comprehensible for many here in Korea. There are also some finger pointing to the company in charge of the ferry, saying that there were only one captain in charge of the uh, charge of the ferries on that unfortunate day since the main captain was on a leave. Normally there are two people, one captain and a subcaptain. And on that day, the subcaptain, who has eight years of experience of steering the ships, was on charge of the ferry. Yes, well, we're seeing the harrowing uh, video there of the events of that day now. And Jian, can you give us a, a recap of what exactly happened and also the number of people that have been rescued, but also those many still missing? Sure, Mark. The Sewerho ferry started to sink sometime around 9 a.m. Wednesday morning, some 20 kilometers off the coast of Chindo Island in southwestern Korea. At least six people have been confirmed dead so far, including a ferry employee, Park ji in her 20s, and four high school students and one who has not yet been identified. So far, the number of people rescued stands at 174, with the remaining 290 or so still missing. The ship was completely submerged underwater just two hours and 20 minutes after it started to tilt. I'll come back with more updates later today. Okay, thank you, Jion. Let's hope there's some good news in the coming hours. That was our Kim Jion reporting on the sinking of a Korean ferry off the country's southwestern coast. Around 300 people, including many high school students, are still unaccounted for. We start before the sun rises to bring you the latest stories out of Korea. We also lead the way with important global coverage. Stay on the pulse of what is happening with Daybreak. Korea and Japan have held their first working level talk solely focused on the Japanese military's sexual enslavement of Korean women during World War II. The two sides met in Seoul late Wednesday to try and resolve their deep differences. But as our Hwang Sang-hee tells us, it will take much more than just one meeting to mend decades of sour ties. Senior officials from Korea and Japan met in Seoul Wednesday as they seek to resolve the long-standing dispute over Japan's wartime sexual enslavement of Korean women. Following two hours of talks, a South Korean official who wished to remain anonymous told reporters that the two sides exchanged their basic stances and held a productive discussion. Korea has been demanding an official apology and legal compensation from Japan for the so-called comfort women. Tokyo claims the issue was settled through a 1965 treaty signed by the two neighbors when they normalized diplomatic ties. The rare meeting is the result of an agreement reached ahead of President Park Geun-hye's first official talks with Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in the Netherlands last month. But just one round of talks was not enough for the two sides to overcome decades of diplomatic tensions. The officials will meet again in May, when Japan hosts a second round of discussions on the comfort women issue, and perhaps even more. I believe there are many issues that Korea and Japan need to exchange views on. Around 200,000 women, mostly Korean, were forced to serve the Japanese army in comfort stations during the early 20th century. When asked whether the officials will discuss a possible summit between South Korea and Japan at their next meeting, the South Korean official did not give a clear answer, but said that the two sides must first build mutual trust. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. While Korea and Japan held talks on the sexual slavery issue, the surviving victims demanded justice outside the Japanese embassy in Seoul, just as they've been doing each and every Wednesday since 1992. Uh, Yulian went to the scene and filed this report. Shouts ring out, calling on Japan to atone for its sexual enslavement of women during World War II. 
Every Wednesday for the past 22 years, victims of the atrocities carried out by Japan relive their painful past here, in front of the Japanese embassy in Seoul. Ahead of the first ever governmental meeting between Korea and Japan on the issue of so-called comfort women, a euphemism for sex slaves, the victims were cautiously optimistic. All we want is the Japanese government to recognize its wrongdoings, apologize and provide legal compensation. But we will have to wait to see what they really have in mind. Civic leaders were concerned that the meeting was simply a show put on by the Japanese government, wary about its strained relationship with the United States in recent months. We will have to see if the Japanese government came to seek resolution or only came because of pressure from Washington ahead of President Obama's visit to Japan and Korea next week. I hope it's the former. With hopes running high, the former comfort women were joined by supporters at the rally. Even the idea of using comfort women is unacceptable. That is the universal opinion. I plead as a Japanese citizen that Japan apologize and make sure such things never happen again. The South Korean government should not give a lukewarm response, but rather make strong demands on behalf of these comfort women. Only 55 Korean women identified as former sex slaves remain alive today. But the doors to the Japanese embassy remain closed to their calls for justice. The ignorance of the Japanese government is becoming ever harder to bear for the victims who have grown frail from decades of waiting. Time is running out. Yurian, Arirang News. At South Korea's National Assembly, lawmakers passed Korea's long-awaited defense cost-sharing pact with the United States. Meanwhile, over in Washington, high-level officials from the two countries discussed the timing of the U.S. handling handing over the uh, wartime operational control to Seoul. Our Jim Young gil has more. The ruling and opposition parties came together to pass a number of long-pending bills this Wednesday at the National Assembly. After months of gridlock, lawmakers passed the revised defense cost-sharing pact with the U.S. Seoul and Washington had agreed in January to renew the special measures agreement that lays out the cost each side pays for the 28,500 U.S. troops stationed on South Korean soil. Under the deal, South Korea will pay some 880 million U.S. dollars annually from this year through 2018, a 5.8 percent increase from its share last year. Approval of the pact was delayed over concerns that it requires Seoul to pay more than is necessary. The main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy had expressed the most concern, wondering aloud whether Washington would divert some of Seoul's share of the money to finance the relocation of a U.S. military base in the country. The ratified bill will go into effect after being signed by President Park Geun-hye. Over in Washington, South Korea and the U.S. opened a high-level military meeting at the Pentagon on Tuesday local time, with North Korea and pending alliance issues topping the agenda. The two-day integrated defense dialogue began with Hull requesting for another delay in the transfer of wartime operational control from the U.S. to South Korea. Seoul is currently scheduled to regain wartime operational control in 2015, but the government says the nation's military needs more time to prepare for the transfer. The two sides have reportedly agreed in principle on a delay due to the ongoing threat posed by North Korea. But the exact timing and other details are still being ironed out. The two allies will sit down with Japan for defense trilateral talks starting Thursday. Kim young Adirang News. Now, rigorous spending aimed at revitalizing the local economy is on the mind of Korea's top economic policymaker. Our economics correspondent Na Hyun Kyung reports on how the government plans to front load more of this year's budget into the first half. Finance Minister Hyun Oh Seok says the government will accelerate its rate of spending in the first half of the year to help boost Korea's economy and make people actually feel the effects of improving economic conditions. Second quarter spending will be expanded to exceed the original first half of the year guideline of 55 percent. The money will be spent with a special focus on supporting the nation's small and mid-sized firms, so that 60 percent of the year's budget allocated for the finance sector is used in the first half of the year.
The government executed 24 percent of its finance budget in the January to March period, that's slightly below its target of 28 percent. The finance minister is now pushing to spend what was left over in the first quarter, plus more than its 27 percent target for the second quarter. Hyun, while stressing Korea's economy is on a path of moderate recovery, emphasized that external uncertainties such as the U.S. stimulus scale back and the slowdown in the Chinese economy should be closely monitored, and he also pledged to spur domestic investment. The government will continue to make sure its $28 billion investment project is run as planned throughout the year. The project consists of 19 tasks aimed at easing regulations on restricted properties and utilizing them to secure investment, for example, for building company towns and special economic zones. Dae hyun Arirang News. Time now for a look through our international headlines this morning. For that, we turn over to our Eunice Kim standing by at the News Center. Good morning, Eunice. And good morning to you, Mark. We are keeping our eyes on Ukraine this morning, where pro-Russian separatists overtook six Ukrainian armored personnel carriers Wednesday on the eve of important talks that will bring the top diplomats of Ukraine, Russia, the EU, and the U.S. in one room. The Ukrainian Defense Ministry confirmed the seizure, saying the troop carriers are now in the hands of uniformed people with no relation to Ukraine's armed forces. The vessels are spotted entering the uh, rebel-held town of Sloviansk with Russian flags topping them. Reuters reports some of the Ukrainian troops were also taken with the vehicles. With Russian President Vladimir Putin warning that Ukraine is on the brink of civil war, NATO Secretary General Andres Fo Rasmussen said the alliance will bolster its military presence in Eastern Europe in defense, deterrence and de-escalation. The foreign ministers of Ukraine, Russia, the EU and the U.S. will meet in Geneva on this Thursday to hash out their disagreements. Nigerian military say most of the more than 100 schoolgirls abducted by armed Boko Haram militants Monday night have been free. They say only eight of the 129 are still missing this, according to CNN. The rescue operation continues in the deep forests of the northeastern town of Chibok that extends to neighboring Cameroon. The military has been helped by volunteers and surveillance helicopters to locate and rescue the teenagers abducted in their sleep Monday by heavily armed Boko Haram gunmen who herded them into trucks, vans and buses after engaging in a firefight with soldiers guarding the school. And over in France, police are finishing the last of a massive DNA test, taking samples from hundreds of students and staff of a school in western France in search of a rapist. A 16-year-old girl was raped in a dark bathroom in a private secondary school in La Rochelle last September, and police had been searching for a DNA match to an imprint found on her clothing. Detectives say only one student has refused to give a sample, citing personal reasons. Some 475 students, 31 teachers and 21 other male adults at the secondary school are reported to have taken part in that DNA test. Mideast peace talks scheduled for Wednesday evening were postponed after a high-ranking Israeli officer was killed in the West Bank. Israel did not give a reason for the delay, but Tuesday, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had condemned Palestinian leaders to, for continuing to, quote, peddle hate-filled material. A spokesman for Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas said it had been rescheduled for Thursday. Now, as many people know, the baseball games here in the nation are well known for the loud and exciting cheering that takes place at the stadiums. But with the tragic accident at sea on Wednesday, the league made sure there would be no excessive cheering. 
With four games taking place in the league last night, not only were there a moment of silence for those who lost their lives and are still missing, the league made sure that there was no cheerleaders and no loudspeaker cheering. While the games were a lot quieter than usual, it was a great decision made by the league. And of course, when the games did take place, the Hanwha Eagles beat the Kia Tigers 8-6 with the Tucson Bears shutting out the Samsung Lions 5-0 and the Nexon Heroes were able to beat the LG Twins once again 5-2. Meanwhile, let's take a look at another big regional rivalry here, the Red Hot NC Dinos taking on the Lotte Giants. Of course, going into the game, here we go over to the first inning of the game. Sona up with an RBI single to center as Lotte takes a 1-0 lead before Luis Jimenez with an RBI ground out scoring Kim Moon Ho for a 2-0 lead. But we're not done yet. Two men on Hwang Jae Gyun, a two-run triple to center, and Lotte has an early 4-0 lead. Third inning of the game, Lee Jong-woo grounds one to second, but an E4 scores Pang min -woo, and it's 3-1. Next play, Na Song Bum at bat, and a pass ball scores Lee Jong-woo from third, but NC cuts the deficit to 4-3 thanks to an RBI sack fly by Lee Ho Jun. Gonna go over to the sixth inning here. Here is Eric Thames, and there it goes deep to right field and gone a two run shot, sparking a four run six as NC takes a seven to four lead. But Lodi scores three runs in the bottom of the inning, rallying back to tie this ball game at seven apiece. And we're gonna go into extra innings once again, but in the tenth inning of the game, Kim Tegun an RBI single to right, and that's the ball game as the NC Dinos beat the Lodi Giants eight to seven. And now moving over to figure skating, where after nearly two months since the Sochi Winter Games closed off, the International Skating Union stated that they have finally received an official complaint from the Korea Skating Union regarding the controversial judgment on Kim Yana. And while most of the fans here in the nation thought the complaint was filed already by the Korea Skating Union, turns out they filed it officially on April 10th, with the ISU confirming it on Wednesday. While it's still in its first stages, fans hope the scoring made during the free skating program can be overturned. And now shifting over to golf, where after the KLPGA kicked off their season last week, the men are ready to kick off their season in the KPGA. And the Tongbu Fire Promi Open J Golf Series will lead off the new season of the KPGA at the Welly Hilly Country Club in Gangwondo Province. With the event taking place from today to the 20th, golfers like Kim Do Hyun and Kim Tae Hoon hope to storm through this season as well. With the KLPGA gaining immense popularity here in the nation, the KPGA hopes to gain popularity as well. And now finishing things off, let's take a look at some AFC Champions League group stage match results from Wednesday night as FC Seoul beat the Central Coast Mariners in a close match 1-0 and the Pong Steelers on top against Sarazo Osaka 2-0, your final score. And with that, that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Well, it's going to be a rainy day today. Heavy showers are expected in Jindo of up to 40 millimeters along with strong gusty winds. And rain could be moderate to heavy at times through the day in other southern provinces, while Seoul and the surrounding area will have a brief period of rain with less than 5 millimeters. And this rain will drag down the temperatures, mainly regions in the south, 7 to 8 degrees lower than yesterday, but similar afternoon highs are expected in the Seoul metro area. So let's take a closer look at those numbers. The morning low here in the capital starts at 9, then it will rise to 22, while highs in Daegu and Gwangju will soar to 20 and 17 respectively, and Busan should top out at 18 later in the day. Now let's see how other regions are looking. It looks like Jeju will reach to 21, Daejeon peak at 19, and Mount Kungang should see a high of 10 this afternoon. Well, that's all for Korea, and here's the global forecast for viewers around the world.
Those are the stories we have for you at this hour. Korea Today is coming up in about 30 minutes' time. They'll have the latest updates on that ferry tragedy in southwestern Korea and uh, the ongoing search for the missing there. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow. Until then, goodbye.